Hello, everyone, and welcome to this CPA exam preparatory course, section financial accounting and reporting, chapter number six. Now that we went through the concepts of financial reporting, revenue recognition, disclosures, uh, accounting for assets, accounting for liabilities, uh, how to prepare consolidated financial statements and how to deal with investments, it's time to deal with select transactions. This part has a weight of 20 to 30% in your financial accounting and reporting exam. So it's such an important part to focus on and to deal with. So what about this part? What does it contain? In this part, we're going to go through the concepts of leases, derivatives, foreign currency accounting, and income taxes. We're going to go through the definition of leases, uh, the parties involved in a lease agreement, how to account for leases and the books of each of those parties. And then later on, uh, we're going to go through the derivatives. We're going to define and identify the main derivatives and uh, the main accounting requirements that have to do uh, with uh, such derivatives. And then we go through foreign currency accounting, foreign currency translation, foreign currency transactions. And finally, we're going to go through income taxes and how to account uh, for income taxes. So let's go directly and straight to the material. So what are leases? How can we define a lease agreement? Leases in general, or a lease agreement in general, this is an agreement between at least two parties. Now, the first party is a party who owns or controls an asset. So again, it's really important to identify the importance of control. It's not just about owning an asset. Sometimes an asset can be a resource that you're controlling. So for example, when you lease a property, this is property that you're controlling. We will discuss it later on. But the first party involved in a lease contract, that would be uh, the lessor. The lessor is a party which owns or controls a property. And then the second party is going to be called the lessee. So the lessor is going to transfer the right to use this property to the other party, that would be the lessee, in return for consideration, any sort of consideration. So this is what the lease agreement is about. Now, the question is, how to identify whether a contract contains a lease or not? So uh, are we talking of a lease or are there any other forms that might look like a lease agreement, but uh, in fact, it's actually not. And uh, what about the main account of treatments and the books of each of the lessor and the lessee? This is what we're going to go through. So what is a lease agreement in general? Leases are used by public and private entities as a means of gaining access to assets and reducing their exposure to the full risk of asset ownership in other terms. So instead, instead of having to pay half the amounts to own an asset, so let it be a building, for example, a lease is a sort of uh, uh, agreement that would give you access to this building without having to actually purchase the building and then to take responsibility of the maintenance and uh, to assume all of the risks of ownership of that building. So as a definition, a lease is a contractual agreement between a lessor. Now, that would be the party owning or controlling the resource initially. Now, this party will convey the right to use any sort of property, whether real or personal property, that would be the asset. To the other party, that would be the lessee, who agrees to pay consideration for this right over a specific period of time. So this is what a lease agreement is about. So we have two parties. We have the lessor who conveys the right to use the property to the lessee who agrees to pay consideration in return for uh, this access to use this asset. Now, the question is, can we categorize or can we classify any contract containing some terms that might look like leases as a lease? No, the answer is no. In fact, to be a lease or contain a lease, both of the criteria must be met, which criteria specifically? Sort of all, they should be an identifiable asset. So the contract must depend on an identifiable asset. So it might be a car, it might be a building, it might be a plot of land, it might be a machine, but there should be an identified asset. Now, by identified asset, we don't necessarily mean a red car with a plate number of A, B, C, D, E. No, it's not the case, but it should be a car. So this is an identified asset. So the first criteria, uh, criterion that would be for the contract to depend on an identifiable asset in which the lessor does not have a substantive substitution right. In other terms, there should be one asset or a group of assets and the lessor that would be uh, uh, the actual owner or the actual party controlling the asset initially uh, cannot substitute right, this uh, asset for another asset unless for uh, other reasons, for example, for maintenance. And then the second criterion that would be for the contract to convey the right to control the use of the asset over the lease term to the lessee. In other terms, for any contract to be classified as a lease, there should be a transfer of the right to control the use. What do we mean by controlling the use? That would be deciding on 
how to use this asset, how to derive benefits from such a use, and most importantly, to limit and to restrict the access to this asset for others. So in other terms, when you lease a, uh, an apartment, for example, when you rent an apartment, can anyone uh, access this apartment without your permission? No. Now, even the lessor cannot do it. So in other terms, you have the right to control this apartment. You can uh, uh, you can decide who's going to use this apartment and uh, when is it going to be used and most importantly, how is it going to be used. So this is the right to control the use of this asset. Now, absent any of those criteria, you cannot say that the contract contains a lease. Now, for example, what if uh, um, you, you have an agreement to transport goods from uh, uh, one place to another uh, through a ship and uh, uh, the commodity or let's say uh, uh, the goods that you can ship are going to occupy substantially uh, most of the area of the ship. So is it a lease agreement? Now you're going to have to check whether uh, uh, there is an identifiable asset and now that would be the ship uh, uh, basically and then whether you have the right to control the use. Who's controlling the ship? Who is managing the ship? This is the main question. So it's not a lease agreement if you're not, you as LC or as the second party, the client, you're not controlling this property. So if you go through the illustration, so look at this illustration about the definition of lease. Bentley Corporation has a written agreement in place to allow Riggs Inc. to use scientific equipment with a book value of $75,000 for the next five years. Bentley has the right to replace the equipment with a comparable piece of equipment during the term, but Riggs is able to use the asset as it wishes for the next five years while keeping any cash inflows associated with outputs from the equipment. So first of all, who are the parties involved in this contract? We have Bentley Corporation, and then we have Riggs. Inc. Now, who's the lessor? Who's the lessee in this case now? First of all, we're yet to identify whether we have a lease. So let's say who's the supplier and who's the client. The supplier is uh, a Bentley Corporation, and then the client is Riggs Inc. Now, under this agreement, Riggs can use scientific equipment having a book value of 75000 for the next five years. Is it a lease agreement? We cannot know yet. We have to check whether we have an identifiable asset. So um, basically, that's the scientific equipment. And then we will have to check whether Riggs has the right to control the use this asset. So let's go directly uh, uh, through the next uh, sentence. So Bentley, that would be uh, the supplier, has the right to replace the equipment with a comparable piece of equipment during the term. But Riggs is able to use the asset as it wishes for the next five years while keeping any cash inflows. In other terms, Riggs, that would be the client, has the right to use the asset Right in any way, and most importantly, uh, uh, Riggs has control over this asset. Now, although Bentley can replace the equipment with a comparable piece of equipment, so it might be the same piece of equipment or any comparable piece, so that's almost the same. It might be for maintenance purposes, right? It's allowable, and in this case, uh, you're still actually Riggs has the right or has the control over this asset. So, this is a lease agreement. This is an example of a lease as there is a contract in place that defines the asset itself, that would be the scientific equipment, recognizes Bentley's right to substitute the asset, but provides Riggs with the economic benefits and direction for the use of the asset. So to have a lease agreement or for any contract to contain a lease component, there should be an identifiable asset and there should be a transfer of the right to control the use of this asset to the client, both, uh, uh, both uh, criteria being met, that would mean that you have a lease agreement. So what about lease contracts? So often lease contracts come as part or actually leases come as part of uh, uh, bigger contracts that contain different obligations. So in any contract, we might need to identify the lease and the non-lease components. What is the non-lease component? That would be any component of the contract that uh, doesn't look like a lease, right? So the decision as what well whether a contract is a lease or contains a lease must be made at the contract inception. So the first thing to do in accounting for leases that would be to identify whether the contract contains a lease or not. That's number one. And then number two, you will have to check the lease components and the non-lease components. So it only may be reassessed if the terms. So Nadine, I'm going to continue the second part of uh, this presentation in, uh, in a couple of seconds, okay? All right, 
Now that we went through uh, the definition of leases, what about lease contracts and how to deal with leases? So the first step in accounting for leases, that would be to analyze the contracts and to identify the lease and the non-lease components in that contract. So what is a non-lease component? That's any component in the contract uh, uh, that doesn't look like a lease, right? So in other terms, some contracts might contain leases and maintenance. Uh, they might contain leases and other services. So we're going to have to differentiate between those components, those obligations, as the contract treatment for each of those obligations might be different. So at contract inception, at the start of the contract, we have to decide on whether a contract contains a lease or whether it does contain other components as non-lease components. So as noted earlier, for a contract or a portion of a contract to be considered lease, the contract must include an identified asset and must convey the right to control this asset. So any component that has an identified asset that includes an identified asset and conveys the right to control this asset is considered as a lease component. Now, once you determine whether, uh, whether you have lease and non-lease components, as a lessee, so that would be as the client, you must assess whether multiple contracts should be combined. So there might be different contracts with the same party regarding the same sort of asset. And you might need to identify the separate lease components within a given contract. Having said that, what about the next step? Now that we have identified the lease versus the non-lease components, what the next step that would be to go and to start accounting for the lease. But how is that done? Now, first of all, we might need to, uh, uh, to, to check whether we're accounting in the books of the lessee or the lessor. So it depends on the party because the treatment in the books of the lessee is so different than that in the books of the lessor. So in the same contract, you might need to differentiate between the different components. You have the lease and you have the non-lease components. What if you have separate lease components? So what if, uh, uh, for example, you have uh, uh, different assets in the same contract? So what are you going to do? Number one, you would need to identify each right to use an underlying asset within the same contract. So is it the right to use different assets in the same way or different rights? This is important. So one right to use an asset equals one separate lease component. So let's say you've entered into a contract with the same party to rent a building, to rent a car, and to rent machinery and the equipment. So how are you going to use the building? How are you going to use the car? How are you going to use uh, uh, the machinery? And uh, what are the rights? So do you have one right to use each asset? So in that case, the building, the lease of a building and the lease of a car, the lease of machinery are three separate leases. Or we have more than one right to use an asset. So in this case, as a lessee, you must determine whether each right equates to a separate lease component for accounting purposes. In other terms, you have different assets, all right, and you have different rights. So are we talking of the same right or different rights? This is the first question. Secondly, what about the same asset? Do you have more than one right to use this asset? How? Are you going to use this asset? And uh, most importantly, uh, how are we going to derive benefits from such a use? So for a contract that includes both lease and non-lease components, as you'll see, you have two options. It's either to treat the lease components as separate units of account from non-lease components. So if a contract includes a lease component and maintenance, as we're going to see in the next example. So you might treat each component separately. That's option number one. And then option number two, that would be to, uh, uh, to treat each separate lease component as combined with a related non-lease component into one unit of account. Now, how do you do such contract allocation? It's simple. You look at the components of the lease and then you identify the way you're going to use uh, or your way, the way you're going to benefit from each of those obligations performed by the resort. And accordingly, you will go through uh, uh, this classification. So look at this example. Example number one is really important. First Science leases two electron microscopes to university for four years each. So the lease term is four years. All right. Now we have two microscopes, and that would be for four years. Microscope FE is leased for monthly payments of $7,750 and comes with maintenance services. So this might be a non-lease component. Now, it's definitely a non-lease component. But the question is, how shall we deal with it? Shall we deal with it separately or as combined with the lease of the microscope? Microscope SQ is leased for monthly payments of $8,600 and also comes with maintenance services, right? Now, the standalone prices for each unit are listed below with price differentials reflecting the difference in microscope power, 
offered at two distinct university locations. So starting with Microscope FE, the standalone price of such a microscope is $400,000, right? And uh, the standalone price of Microscope SQ, that would be $450,000, whereas the maintenance for FE uh, would cost uh, uh, separately $30,000, and that of SQ would cost $35,000 for a total of $915,000. Now, this is not the contract value. 915, that would be total standalone prices. So for each component, all right, we have identified uh, the standalone price, that would be the price we would get if we take this component separately. The total standalone prices is $915,000. Now, the university will not pay maintenance fees for the microscopes outside of the agreed upon monthly payments noted above. So we're required to calculate the consideration allocation under a scenario in which, number one, the lease and non-lease components are treated separately, and number two, the lease and the related non-lease components are combined into a single unit of account. So is it up to the receipt to identify or to determine whether uh, whether uh, uh, those components are to be combined together or not? No, it depends on the circumstances. So can you separate those components on other terms? Can you take, so can you lease the microscope without having access to the maintenance services or is it mandatory? So for example, it's a unique microscope offered by the lessor and this lessor doesn't normally uh, rent microscopes without providing maintenance services that would be uh, um, to make sure uh, or to guarantee the functioning of the microscope. All right. So in this case, it's a combined unit. But if you can opt for each uh, component or each service separately, then in this case, you will have to separate them. So we need to calculate the consideration allocation under a scenario in which the lease and non-lease components are treated separately and then they are treated combined. So let's start with option number one. Now, in option number one, that would be separate leases and non-lease components. All right, so what are we going to do? Now, we have four components in this case. We have uh, the lease of microscope FU, uh, FE, sorry, that of microscope SQ, the maintenance of FE, and the maintenance of SQ. So those are the standalone prices for each of those components. What are we, what is, uh, what we need to do next, that would be to calculate the portion of the standalone price out of the total standalone prices. So, for example, the portion of uh, $400,000 out of $915,000. So, that would be almost 44%. So, by dividing four hundred by 915, that would be 44%. I'm going to do the same for the remaining prices. So, by dividing 450 by 915, I would get 49%. 30 by 915, I'll get 3%, and 35 by 915, I'll get 4%. All right. And then what's the next step? I will calculate or I will multiply the contract value by this allocation. But the question is, how much is the contract value? All right. Now, if you go back to the facts, all right. So, microscope FE. So, if you start with microscope FE, so for this microscope, we have monthly payments of 7,000. $750, so that's $7,750, all right, uh, per month, so that would be 12 payments per year, over four years. So the total amount that would be $7,750 multiplied by 12, multiplied by four. So this is what has to do with uh, the microscope FE, that would be a total of $372,000. Now, what about the second microscope, microscope SQ. So for the second microscope, that would be a payment of 8,600 per month over 12 months over four years, right? And uh, uh, oh, by multiplying 8,600 by 12 by four, you would get a total of 412,800. So that would be a total, a total of 372 plus 412,800. That would be a total of 784,800. So this is the contract price, all right? The lease contract for both microscopes has a total consideration of $784,800. Now, I have to allocate this amount to each of the four components, all right? So I would have to allocate the 784800 to the lease of microscope FE and then to that of microscope SQ and then to the maintenance of each of those microscopes. All right, so I'm going to multiply 784800 by 44% to get the value for this first contract. And then I'm going to do the same for microscope 
SQ. So multiply by 784, 800, that will give 384. And then the same for the maintenance of each of those components or microscopes, right? And in this way, I would get uh, uh, the value or I would get uh, uh, the allocated price in that contract for each of those components. So the total must be 784, 800. So in other terms, any contract of a total of 784, 800, 345, 312 to be allocated to the rent of microscope FE, 384552 to the rent of microscope SQ, 23544 to the maintenance of FE, and 31392 for the maintenance of SQ. So later on, the accounting for those leases and the related services are going to be made based on those figures. All right. Now, what about scenario number two? This is a scenario in which I'm going to consider I'm going to combine the lease and non-lease components. So for each microscope, I'm going to take uh, the rent of the microscope and the maintenance all together. And the same applies for the second one. So uh, the same logic to be applied, but instead of treating each component separately, I'm going to combine the lease of the microscope and the related maintenance. So for FE, it's going to be a total of 430,000 being the, to, uh, the total, uh, the sum of the 400, that would be the standalone price of microscope FE and the 30,000, the maintenance, All right? And the same to be made for microscope SQ, that would be a total 485. And then later on, I will calculate the portion of each component out of the total standalone prices. So 430,000 divided by 915,000, and then 485 divided by 915,000, all right? That would give 47% for the first one and 53% for the second one. And then later on, each portion multiplied by 784, 800 would give the actual figure or the figure I'm gonna use to account for such leases, all right? So, the first step that would be to identify uh, the existence, whether we have a lease uh, or not, and then to separate the lease components from non-lease components if possible. Now, uh, what about this next step? Now that we have uh, identified the existence of a lease and we have identified the different components of the lease agreement, we will have to continue for the lease classification and the books of each of the lessee and the lessor. Now, remember, we have two parties and two different treatments, right? Now, for the lessee, the lessee would account for the lease as either an operating lease or a finance lease. Now, I have to warn you that those types of leases are somehow different than what we used to use previously. So those requirements for accounting for leases are somehow new. And so we're still using the same terminology, but with different treatments. So for the lessee, you would differentiate between two main types of leases. We have the operating and the finance lease. And the accounting treatment uh, would depend on this classification. This classification would be made at the inception of the lease. Now, what about the lessor? The lessor would uh, gonna have to differentiate uh, between three main types of leases. We have the operating lease, which is totally different than that of the receipt. So don't mix up those concepts together. We have a sales type lease, and then we have a direct finance lease. So for the SE, it's either operating or finance. For the SO, it's either operating lease, sales type lease, or direct financing lease. The accounting treatment is gonna depend on such classification. So the classification is really important. So this is it. For the SE, we have the operating lease and a finance lease. And for the SO, we have also an operating lease and a finance lease, but the finance lease might either be sales type lease or direct financing lease. It's important to note that the concepts or the terminology is the same, but the concepts and the treatment is totally different. Now, what about the changes? Traditionally, we used to account for leases. Initially, we used to account for leases as expenses in uh, the p and income statement, and that's it. And then later on, we used to differentiate between two main types, the operating and the finance lease, right? The operating lease, or actually the finance lease, that would be the lease that would substantially transfer all of uh, uh, the risk and rewards of ownership to the receipt. So for example, a lease with, uh, uh, let's say, uh, with a transfer of ownership at the end of the term, or uh, that would be uh, a lease with a written bargain purchase option, or a lease for uh, uh, the majority of the useful life of the asset. So in such a case, the risk and rewards of ownership uh, are deemed to be transferred to the lessee. So that was a finance lease. And then any other uh, uh, type of lease would be classified as operating lease. Now, 
under finance leases, we used to capitalize the leases, whereas under operating lease, it was still the same old traditional treatment. Now everything has changed. Now for the lessee, whether it was an operating lease or a finance lease, you have to capitalize, right? You have to capitalize. Right? What, what about that? In fact, any lease agreement is about transfer of control over the use of an asset from one party to another. And then when you control a resource, that would be uh, that would satisfy the definition of an asset. So when you control a resource, even if if that would be for one or two years, but uh, basically it's uh, it's it satisfies the definition of an asset, isn't it? So you're controlling a resource, so that should be classified as an asset. So it should be capitalized. But at the same time, you're committing as a lessee uh, to a series of payment, or you're committing uh, to pay consideration to other party. So it does satisfy the definition of an obligation, and so it's a liability. So this is why. This is why in all sorts of leases, the general says in all sorts of leases, the lessee would have to capitalize. So would have to recognize both an asset and a liability, right? Both an asset and the liability. All right, now it would be the same, whether it was an operating or a finance lease, but the difference would consist in the subsequent treatment. Now at the inception of the lease, at the start of the lease, the lessee would now have to capitalize to recognize both an asset and a liability, all right? And uh, this is somehow different uh, from the rules we used to apply previously. Now, what about the lessor? The lessor has different treatments and it depends on the classification of the lease. This is what we're gonna see next. So let's start with the lessee. The lessee would have to differentiate between operating leases and finance leases. So what is the difference, all right? Now, it's simple. Now, let's memorize or let's get introduced to a new mnemonic to memorize that would be owns, right? O, W, N, E, and S. That would be owns, right? So it's a finance lease whenever it's one of owns. And if not, it is an operating lease. So I'm going to write here, no owns, right? So it's a finance lease whenever you have any of the owns and it's an operating lease whenever you have none, right? What about the owns? Now, number one, if the lease agreement transfers the ownership to the lessee at the end of the lease term, then that would be the ownership criterion that has been met. Ownership, right? The O stands for ownership. And then if the contract includes a written bargain purchase option, written bargain purchase option, that's the W, right? Any of the owns must be there for, for the lease to be a finance lease, not necessarily altogether. So transfer of ownership or written bargain purchase option. Or if the present value of the lease payments, if what are you going to pay as lease payments in present value, that would be 90% or more of the assets fair value. Right? That's the N. Or if you're going to lease the asset for the majority of the economic life. So almost 75% of economic life, right? Or if the asset is specialized in a way, no one but the lessee can use it. So for example, it was a customized satellite, let's say, all right? So it's customized based on your needs and no one else might be able to use it. So it's a specialized asset, all right? If any of those five conditions is met, then this is a finance lease. Okay, If any of those five has been met, then this is a finance lease, only one, right? Not necessarily all. Now, if none, then it's an operating lease. So what about the difference between uh, the treatment under an operating lease or under a finance lease? Now, at the start, it would be exactly the same. You would have to capitalize an asset to recognize an asset and related liability, all right? Now, later on, the subsequent treatment is gonna depend on whether it's an operating lease and a finance lease, right? So that's the classification for the lessee. What about the lessor? Now for the lessor, it's gonna be almost the same, almost the same concepts, but different treatments. So in other terms, now for the lessor, if any of the owns has been met, which uh, the, basically mean that this is finance lease for the lessee, this is a saves type lease. So any of owns to be met, then this is a sales type lease for the lessor, right? Now, if none of the owns has been met, 
then it's an operating lease for the lessee, but for the lessor, it might be either a direct financing lease as a finance lease or an operating lease. So how to determine whether it's a direct finance lease or an operating lease? It depends on whether two additional conditions have been met. What? So if both conditions, the P and C, the P and C have been met, then this is a, a direct financing lease. So what is P and C? In fact, if the present value of the lease payments all right, is equal or exceeds the underlying assets fair value, then this is when you might have a direct financing lease. Now, remember, you just need any of the owns to be met to have a sales type lease for the lessor, but you need both P and C to be met. Now, let's get back to the P. Now, the present value of the sum of lease payments, didn't we just say that uh, it's almost the same condition as the N? No, it's different. There is a difference between both conditions. Now, for the N, that would be all lease payments and any guaranteed residual value, right? To be included in such a calculation. So what is the guaranteed residual value? This is when, for example, you lease a property and then you promise the lessor that when you return it back, it might be uh, uh, worth, let's say, uh, $1 million, right? So if not, you will have to compensate them for the difference. So that's the guaranteed residual value. Now, when calculating the N, when determining the N, you will have to take into account the guaranteed residual value by the lessee. Whereas for the P, it should be not, it shouldn't be included. So in other terms, the present value of the sum of the lease payments, let's see guaranteed residual value not included, but any third guaranteed residual value to be included. So in other terms, the only difference would be in the existence of a guaranteed residual value by the lessee. For the N, you will have to take it into account. For the P, you don't have to take it into account. And then the collection of the lease payments is uh, almost uh, uh, certain. So in that case, if both P and C are met, but none of the owns, then it's a direct financing lease for the lessor. So let's repeat it again. Now, for the C, it's either an operating or a finance lease, right? If any of the owns has been met, then it's definitely a finance lease. If none of the owns are there, then it's an operating lease. For the lessor, it's either an operating lease or a sales type or direct financing lease. It would be a sales type lease if any of the owns Matt, it would be a direct financing lease if no owns, but both pre and C, but, and if no owns and no P plus C, remember, no P plus C, not just, so uh, the mere existence of any of both P and C, all right, means that it's an operating lease. So if no owns and no P plus C, then in this case, that would be an operating lease for the lessor. Right? Now, the classification is so important for the subsequent treatment for the leases. For the lessee, you're always going to have to uh, uh, register an asset to recognize an asset and the liability with some exemptions. And for the lessor, Right, you're going to have to uh, to do the treatment based on whether it's an operating lease or a finance lease. This is what we're going to cover in the next part. Having said that, ladies and gentlemen, we're done with the first part. That would be the identification of the lease and the lease classification. What about the next part? That would be the initial recognition and then the subsequent measurement of leases.